Earlier this year, I reported a story exposing the child sex change program at Texas Children's Hospital. Uh, doctors and administrators had promised to stop these procedures, uh, but as I discovered through a whistleblower report, they continued to administer puberty blockers and cut up kids as young as 11 years old. The story started a firestorm in the media, and within 36 hours, Texas legislators voted to permanently ban child sex change procedures for minors. My source for the story was anonymous, but after publication, the federal government launched an investigation at the hospital and has threatened this individual with federal prosecution. So rather than run and hide, my source has decided to come forward to reveal his identity, to reveal his name, to reveal his face, to stand up for his whistleblowing, to stand against what's happening at Texas Children's Hospital and others. And so I'm grateful and proud to be joined by Dr. Eitan Heim, a general surgeon who completed his residency at Texas Children's. And so let's just begin. Uh, tell us uh, who you are, tell us a bit about your background, and tell us how you got here as the whistleblower behind this explosive story. Yeah, well, my name is Eitan Heim, and even though it's spelled Ethan, it's pronounced Eitan. Um, but, you know, I grew up in Central Florida. You know, I have a great family, still really close with them, and really great upbringing. My dad is a doctor, and I saw how much his profession meant to him, and how much he cared for his patients, and how his patients cared that he was taking care of them. So I always wanted that for myself, so that's the reason I went into medicine. So I went to undergraduate and then uh, medical school in Florida, and then I started my general surgery training at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. And for me, you know, this was a huge deal because you know, I really come from a prestigious background, and Baylor College of Medicine, the surgery program there, is one of the best in the country. We, you know, we train at some of the best hospitals, Bentob, which is one of the best trauma hospitals, St. Luke's, which is amazing as well, and then Texas Children's, which is the biggest children's hospital in the world, where you do some of the, the best surgeries, especially on some of the sickest children who need it the most. So you know, during my time in residency, um, I met my wife, Andrea. We got married. She's a great lawyer. She's an assistant U.S. attorney in Dallas. So right now, I, I just finished my residency in June and started my general surgery practice in a small town outside of Dallas. And it's been great so far. Great. And so um, help, help us paint a picture of what you saw, because you're excited to go to Baylor. You're excited to, to train with these great surgeons. But then at some point, you started seeing your colleagues doing some of these you know, so-called gender-affirming care procedures. Take me back to that initial inkling of seeing something and, and having this intuition that something wrong was happening. Yeah, I, I think it really goes back to early 2022, because during that time, you had these, that was the first time you had these major academic medical centers, like Massachusetts General and Vanderbilt Care caught up in this huge controversy about their pediatric transgender programs. And once the details were, were revealed to the public, it was like the first time that people saw these bubbly young doctors in videos talking about gender-affirming mastectomies on kids, which is shocking. And then in another video, you saw these same people bragging about how much money they were making. And I think it really started to wake people up to what was happening. So a little bit after that, in March of 2022, the Texas Attor Attorney General, Ken Paxton, had issued an opinion stating that, quote unquote, this gender affirming care could be investigated as child abuse. So in response to that, Texas Children's Hospital, the largest children's hospital in the world, had issued a statement publicly, unequivocally stating they were going to shut down their transgender program. And for me, this was a huge relief. I thought that maybe the tides were turning. But it was very soon after that I found out this was categorically untrue. It was only three days after they had released that statement that they had implanted a pu puberty blocking device into an 11-year-old girl with gender dysphoria. And this wasn't just one-off case. Over the next couple of months, this only accelerated. And I knew this to be true because I knew the people who were doing the procedures. I was doing surgery at the hospital. And people would tell me about how they were implanting these puberty blocking devices into 11, 12, 13-year-old kids. 
they told me about how these kids had all these psychiatric issues that were going uh, uh, unmanaged and just being attributed to this one thing. And uh, uh, seven months after they released that statement, the head of the transgender program, which according to the public did not exist, was given the opportunity to speak at the hospital's most prestigious lecture series. It's called Grand Rounds. And in it, he talked about how he was running this active transgender clinic, seeing patients who were very young, and he talked about this algorithmic approach to how he was managing these people. You know, with the social transition, puberty blockers for uh, adolescent kids, hormones, and then surgery. And you almost can't believe that they would make this statement publicly, and then within the hospital, it's such a high priority, but according to the public, they don't even know what's happening. And it, it was even more peculiar when I realized that the program was even listed on the website, right? And that's important because even the departments of the hospital that treat these ultra-rare diseases have a section on the website so that people can go and uh, uh, schedule appointments and see the doctors, but the transgender clinic didn't have an appointment, didn't have a, a page on their website. So it's obvious to anyone paying attention that the reason they were doing this, the reason they were hiding this program was because they knew it was controversial. They knew that the people of Texas wouldn't approve of it. And especially once you know the details of what was happening, right, in the clinics, like what's actually happening, that every kid who walks into that clinic is being told that they have to adopt this identity that's based off hatred of their true self. And if they or their family express even the slightest bit of hesitation, they're gonna be threatened with their own suicide. And if these kids do go down that path, they're gonna be turned into chronic medical patients. They're gonna be permanently tied to the boundaries of a hospital in order to obtain these drugs or manage complications from surgery. And they're risking their ability to participate in one of the most meaningful human endeavors, which is like the, the ability to have a family and children. And instead of telling these kids that they're perfect the way they are, that growing up is hard and they can grow up to be something amazing, they're telling them to adopt this false identity that is based off their own self-hatred. And they're doing it for their own self-righteousness. And once I, I knew that was happening, it was, it was something that I knew I had to do something about because if people knew I had the ability to make a change or speak up about it and they knew I stayed silent, then you know, I could never forgive myself and I don't think my future generations would too. And tell me a bit about your colleagues. These are people who are highly educated, they're highly intelligent, they have credentials from the best uh, medical schools in the world, including Harvard Medical School, one of your colleagues, and yet they're fanatically committed to this practice of medicine that for me as a, as a layman, just uh, uh, learning about this, looking at some of the medical literature, seems uh, uh, kind of preposterously undersupported. Yeah. And in fact, many other countries uh, uh, that, are, that are, are, are kind of left liberal friends, typically appeal to mm -hmm. on social programs yeah. and, other, and other policies, are starting to back away from. But describe the mentality of the doctor who is you know, cutting the arm open of an 11-year-old girl, inserting a puberty lock blocking device. Why is this person doing that specifically mm -hmm. in your experience? You know, I, I think to answer that question, you have to understand the environment in academic medical centers and how that changed over the past couple of years. Because if you understand that, then I think you can answer that question. And in order to understand it, you have to understand what happened with COVID. Because the changes that occurred are what allowed the transgender ideology to proliferate and what allowed doctors to be able to do this to children on a large scale. And I believe it can be simplified to really two important things. First was this prioritization of ideology over evidence. And then second was the censorship of anyone who questioned that ideology with the presentation of evidence. And when I say ideology, the specific, specific thing I'm talking about is this belief that truth is subjective, that it's independent of objective reality. 
So something is true because they say it's true, not because they observe it in the world around them. And this is concerning when you see it in a college classroom, but it's much more concerning when it's a driving force behind medical recommendations. And this is what we saw during COVID. The, the safety and effectiveness of the interventions they had recommended were not based off reliable, uh, good quality data or, or even basic logical reasoning. It was safe and effective because they said it was safe and effective. And when you have medical recommendations that are completely divorced from reality, you can guarantee they're not gonna be only ineffective, but also likely very harmful. And that's exactly what we saw. And there's no better example than this than you know, the high priest of COVID himself, Anthony Fauci, the self-anointed embodiment of you know, the science. You know, he's someone who I wouldn't let take care of my goldfish, but somehow he became America's top doctor. And the only reason this was able to happen is because you had the censorship of anyone who questioned that ideology, which is a second big change. And it wasn't only the withdrawal of these opinions, right? But it was the demonization of anyone who expressed that opinion who was challenging this ideology. And no place was this more prevalent and more aggressive, and it occurred with a greater frequency than at academic medical centers. So when you consider these two changes as the driving forces behind COVID, you understand that the transgender ideology is simply a continuation of that. And what they're doing is just taking it to a different level because they're claiming to be something to be true, which is in the most obvious way, untrue. And because you don't have voices within the medical community who are willing to stand up and challenge it, you have these things go unopposed and you have these things proliferate. And before you know it, it becomes just a part of the medical standard. When you really take a close look at it, it should have never been in the first place. Because people can talk about the, all the data they want, but at the end of the day, you don't need a randomized controlled trial you know, to tell you not to drive your truck into a pothole, right? When you look at the underlying idea behind what they're doing, it should have never been done in the first place. And what, what though, the, the actual doctors, surgeons, medical administrators, um, they're, in my view, not simply mistaken, not simply this is a, 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 a kind of exciting, innovative form of medicine, we're gonna take it to the next level, uh, we were deceived by the data and we've decided to, to, to now change tack. Um, they have a, a, an ideological yep. commitment, maybe even something deeper. What do they get out of this? That's something that is uh, always on the forefront of my mind. I think what they get out of it is meaning. And I think meaning is so important because it's one of those things that every human strives towards, right? We want to find meaning in our lives because we want our lives to have meant something. But as we've seen in the past few years, people want that without the work required to do anything meaningful. They want to be righteous without the difficulty of acting in a moral and virtuous way. They want to be able to speak up and, and speak out for people who are you know, uh, uh, you know, oppressed, but they, they don't want to put themselves in a position where they really have to challenge something powerful. So I think that when you have this abandonment of these traditional Western moral values, it's gonna be filled by a void that can be taken up by anything. And in this case, people are looking for something that will fill that void and the transgender ideology is what has filled it. But the most unfortunate thing is that the consequences of that is the future of these kids. Because the future that we had growing up, right? Like all those great memories we had, you know, or your first girlfriend, you know, you know, those, those things that are fundamental to a normal upbringing are gonna be manipulated 
to such a degree that you don't even know what the consequences are in the future. Yeah. And, and, and then talk about some of these uh, kids, not specifically, but in general as a class. I mean, in, in your opinion, in your experience and observation, they're coming in obviously struggling. These are kids that have uh, psychological issues, that have interpersonal issues, sexual identity issues. Um, yeah. Talk about kind of what, what, what are some common themes of the kids that are coming in, presenting with these symptoms, and then tell me how this either achieves or fails to achieve the stated objectives of making them whole, making them integrated, making them functional. I think the important thing when you consider any treatment for kids, any intervention that's going to permanently alter their physiology is there's a principle of limited understanding for kids. And it makes sense because kids don't have the life experiences to understand the consequences of their actions, which is why you try to put the right food on the table for dinner or make sure they hang out with the right friends. So when they're going through hard times, when they're struggling with this identity crisis, when they have depression, anxiety, all these issues, it's so important that the adults in their lives put them in the right position to be successful in the future, to where they can live their lives and be happy. So you have this situation where you have these confused adolescent children who are going into these clinics who are simply looking for answers. And an answer is being provided for them. Only if they adopt this new identity, if, these take, if they take these medications and follow them down that path. So all that anger, all that angst, all that anxiety is now driven into this one identity. It's given as an answer to it. So they adopt it, right? It makes them feel good. It's like the, the uh, um, illusion of temporary effectiveness because you're giving them this new community to be a part of. Yeah. But it's not based off something that's true, right? And that's the most important thing. And because it's not based off something that's true, it can't be sustained for the future. And there's going to be a point where these kids wake up one day, right? after taking these medications for years, after undergoing surgeries, after adopting a new name, and, and you know, abandoning the name that's been given to them by the two people who've loved them the most. And they're going to wake up and realize they've gone so far down the road. And they're going to, they're going to realize that they can't even recognize themselves. And I can't imagine how terrifying that would be. And, and they would think to themselves, you know, who am I? Like, what's been done to me? Like, they look at their body, like, there's no going back. And the only conclusion is that the people who are supposed to protect them, the people who are supposed to love them, were the ones who had put them in that position. They were the ones who had fed them to the wolves. And we wonder why the rate of suicide is so high in these people. That's right. And, and, and it's not just psychological, which is hard enough. These are physiological changes. And I'd like you to tell me a bit more about what that means. Because the, the meme or the propaganda line that you hear mm -hmm. from the trans activists is that puberty blockers are totally reversible. Um, they're equivalent to taking a couple aspirin, and then yeah. you stop, and everything goes back <clears throat> to normal. But again, from a kind of civilian standpoint, anyone that is, uh, you know, a drug that is blocking a child's puberty is sick. I mean, it, it, it has to be significant. Yeah. It can't be like drinking a, a cup of, uh, of chamomile tea. Um, and then the hormones in adolescence. Walk us through the physiological consequences and risks of the procedures that you saw happening at Texas Children's. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think that's a really good point because that's, that's one of the most common things you hear is that this thing is reversible. But... Um, they often justify the use of puberty blockers because they use it to treat other children a similar age with the same medications. But the one thing they fail to highlight is that these other children have identifiable diseases with measurable hormonal ab abnormalities. You're talking about precocious puberty, right? It, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So when you give them this medication, right, you take them from a state of disease, like overproduction of a hormone, to a state of health or one that more closely resembles their natural physiology. But when you have a kid without hormonal abnormalities and you give them these medications, 
by definition, you take him from a state of health and then you put him into a state of disease. It would be like giving someone with normal blood pressure a bunch of medications that lower their blood pressure, right? But there's something more sinister going on when you think about giving these medications to these children during the time of puberty when they don't have a disease. It has to do with the hormone that's being blocked. So the hormone is it's called gonadotropin releasing hormone. It's referred to as GNRH. And it's released from this structure called your hypothalamus, which is like this small little almond-sized structure in one of the deepest parts of your brain. And your hypothalamus is referred to as your command center of your body because it controls all the other hormonal processes. So your sexual function, your reward system with dopamine, your fight or flight response. So although you have these other physiological systems to see, hear, and interact with the world around you, it's the processes that come from your hypothalamus that determines how you feel about the world around you. And put in another way, this is you know, your emotions, right? And, but to talk about it in like cold physiological terms would be a mistake because it's not just some hormone factory that you could switch on or off without consequence. And the reason is the delicate balance produced from this structure, the product of it is so much greater than the sum of its components. Like somehow these tiny little particles swimming through your bloodstream interact with each other to give rise to like the, the, the spectrum of, of human emotions. And think about how important that is during puberty, right? When you're 11, 12, 13 years old. Like how you felt like after your first crush in middle school or listening to your favorite album for the first time. Or how you felt getting into your first fight after you saw your best friend get picked on. And these are all the things that are so important for growing up. And you know, it, it's, I don't think it's a coincidence when you look at the Greek derivation of the word hypothalamus because it translates to beneath the inner chamber. And I think if there was one place to protect the human emotional experience, it would be here, right? Beneath the inner chamber in the hypothalamus. So I think that's why it's so wrong to disrupt these pathways in these children during such a critical moment when there's no hormonal disease present in the first place. Because to disrupt this process is to disrupt one of the most important things that makes us human. So you're a uh, kind of surgery resident. You see this happening. You hear that they're going to stop these procedures. They immediately restart them and, in fact, expand them. Mm -hmm. You're seeing kids that are being subjected to ideological, psychological, and physiological uh, regimens that are destructive to their health, to their sense of well-being, to their sense of self, that have no support from medical evidence. Mm -hmm. um, what do you do? And what leads you to then reach out to me to say, hey, something has gone horribly wrong here. I want to blow the whistle. So after seeing the changes that happened the past few years in the medical profession, I knew that if I didn't do something, I didn't know what kind of world I would be delivering my future children into. That even if the risks were really high, which they were and they are, something has to be done about it. Because if not now, then when? If I don't take a risk, then I'm just passing those conflicts on to my children, future generations. So once I made the decision to do it, I was going to do it because I knew it was wrong. I knew it was a professional obligation of mine because pr this misconduct was happening on a huge level. It was happening to the most innocent of patients, to children. So after I knew these procedures had been happening, it was only accelerating. It was a high priority in the hospital, but the public was being deceived about the existence of it. I knew I couldn't go to the hospital because they were, they were uh, the ones who were responsible for it. So, and I knew the people of Texas wouldn't stand for it either. I knew they didn't support this kind of thing. So I knew if it was public, there was a good chance something could be done about it. And if there was a chance that this could stop in Texas then, 
there were, then a lot of kids could be protected. So I began reaching out to journalists. And it, I actually couldn't believe how, many, how, how much failure it was. I mean, I, I, you know, people just <laughs> ignore me for a really long time. Uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty remarkable. Wow. Because I thought it was a, a pretty. It's a big story. Yeah. Big, yeah, big story, right? I mean, yeah, yeah it was. And what, what reasons did they give you for? You know, I don't know. I think yeah. they just, they were like, yeah, who's this guy? Like, yeah. he's, a, he's a nobody. It doesn't Trust. matter. Trust. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so it was five months later. It took me five months, dozens and dozens of emails, huh. right? Just trying to reach out to people. And it was just a bunch of failure. Yeah, I just kept on going, though. And there was a really, and I'm not just saying this for the sake of the story, but it's true, right? Uh, we were about to give up, but then I was like, all right, we'll just give it one last chance. And then I reached out to your team, and then you guys had gotten back to me. And I thought the timing, I mean, just couldn't be more perfect. Because, you know, we kind of went through that vetting process. And then I remember you had told me about the vote the next week on SB14. And it was kind of embarrassing because I didn't even know what SB14 was. Uh, I didn't even know it was being voted on. And I guess, you know, for the sake of clarification, SB14 was a law in Texas that was going to ban hormone-based interventions for kids with gender dysphoria. Yeah. So, I mean, for you, I mean, what was that for you? Yeah, like, yeah. You first... I mean, well, for me, it's interesting. Of course, you get emails, and, and, uh, and you know, I've told my team, is always assume that the person reaching out with a story is attempting to deceive you and ruin your reputation. Yeah. I yeah. mean, that, that's like the level of skepticism you have to come. And then big stories especially, controversial stories especially. We know for a fact, you know, from my own experience, um, I had been doing some of these stories on kind of transgender medicine, activism, you know, at, at hospitals in Chicago and elsewhere. And then the American Medical Association, the Children's Hospital Association, all of the major medical orgs representing like a billion dollars in annual muscle uh, um, sent a letter to the Attorney General saying reporters who are investigating transgender medicine are subjecting people to danger. You need to investigate them and force social media companies to silence them. Then it's kind of realizing, all right, this is big because you not only have uh, exposing these procedures at a major children's hospital, the largest children's hospital in the world. But what made it especially big were two other factors. One, that the hospital was lying about it. They were denying that they were doing it. They said, mm -hmm. we shut this down, and they didn't do anything of the sort. And it was a high priority in the hospital. I mean, exactly. these people were speaking at the most prestigious Grand Round lectures, Exactly. Right? And so yeah. we had those, those lecture videos. And, uh, and then also the fact that it was being subjected to political debate. And mm -hmm. so I knew the legislators who, whom I had spoken with. And, and then, of course, we timed the publication of the story within you know, 24, 36 hours before they were going to go to vote. Um, and, and what happened in that uh, uh, intervening period is that legislators not only voted to ban it, but I know for a fact through some of my other contacts that when we published the, the, the interview with you, the story featuring your, your whistleblower documents, um, those documents were going by hand to every legislator's office mm -hmm, in the mm -hmm. state capitol. And even some Democrats uh, mm -hmm. came on board yeah. to say, hey, wait a minute. We're cutting up kids because of gender. Th it's like, I mean, look, kind of middle of the road Texas Democrats um, were shocked when they saw what was happening. And I think they were also deeply offended that the children's hospital that receives a lot of money from the state and from the federal government was lying. Mm -hmm. That, that st strikes me as something unconscionable. And so, um, you, know, uh, you know, from my point of view, you know, this is a big story. But from your point of view, too, watching it silently, anonymously, kind of secretly, um, tell me what happened. And then tell me also what happened. Presumably, you go back into the hospital, and people are talking about it. Uh, and they don't know that it's you to kind of uh, to tell, tell me through, to talk me through your emotions and your experience. Yeah. You know, the, it, it was odd because when it first happened, it's like these two different worlds that exist because you see the story just blowing up and you see all, all these people you listen to and, and admire who are sharing this story and, and, and expressing shock about it. And it's surreal. And, but then in the hospital, although it might be hard to believe, most people didn't even know it happened. Yeah, wow. Yeah, really, most people didn't even know. Uh, no one really talked about it because it's, 
if you're in that environment, it kind of makes sense because when you're a surgical resident, especially on a busy service, you're, you're just you're swamped with consults, with surgery, and all that. So oftentimes what happens in the outside world mm. stays in the outside world, and you focus so much on just taking care of your patients. But, the, but your colleagues that were doing these procedures, what, what, what were they like when you saw them in, in the halls or in the, in the meeting rooms afterwards? Because those folks absolutely did hear about it, right? Yeah. Mo, mo, no, most of them didn't. No, really, which is crazy. Wow. No, no, really, yeah. But most of those people didn't even agree with what they were doing. You think so? I know so. I know so. so yeah. well, I, I, explain that. What, 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 what makes you think that or what conversations did you have? Yeah. You know, I think that when, even if you have people who don't agree with the procedure, it's an odd thing because they'll do it anyway. And I think they just don't think too much about it. And it's on the schedule. This is what we got to do. And they Go just, do it. yeah, they just do it. And I, I think that's one of the problems with medicine and surgery for the past couple of years because there's consequences to these things. It's so important for doctors to tell the truth and to adhere to the principles that guide our profession. Because there's a saying in surgery, and it goes that you know, bad doctors make for dirty wounds. Mm. Whenever you're taking care of someone, you have to confront reality head on. You have to speak the truth. Even if it's some nasty, dirty, disgusting wound, you have to go in there, you have to clean it out. And that's the only way to make sure that wound heals. And for us, it's like the only way to make sure that we can preserve our profession is by confronting these problems. And I think a lot of people just don't want to confront the reality of what it really means because it's been so normalized. People don't want to think about what's really happening. And I've noticed too that um, one of the great disappointments that, that has kind of beset you know, me personally in the last few years you know, reporting on these issues, doctors have basically remained silent. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think you need a, a, an MD from uh, you know, Vanderbilt to, to say, hey, wait a minute, this seems uh, completely crazy what we're doing. Uh, you're seeing evidence now mounting that it has negative consequences. You're seeing lawsuits getting filed. And I've asked a number of, of doctors, and I want to ask you the same question. Why on earth are there not more, presumably even kind of politically aligned doctors, conservative doctors? Why aren't they speaking out about this? Why is it up to journalists and podcasters and others mm -hmm. uh, who, who, are, who are on the outside to, to, to raise the alarm about this? You know, it's such an important point because the most important people that need to speak out are average doctors, people like me. That's right. Right? People who are in the community. And I think it has to do with the changes that we've seen in, in the medical community over the past couple of years with censorship and the risk of demonization that anyone who speaks out, the, the risk to the person is directly proportional to the power they hold. Because the people who are pushing this know that the ones in power, like people who run these academic centers, if they were to say something, if they were to do something, if they were to start asking questions, they could really make a meaningful change, right? So the people in these positions know that they will lose a lot, that the risks are not only theoretical, but they're real if they do speak out. So if you would have, if you, you know, you came to me anonymously, but if you were to speak up at the Grand Rounds, if you were to write a letter to the hospital's general counsel, if you were to write an op-ed in the newspaper saying, you know, I'm a surgical resident at Baylor, I'm deeply concerned about this, um, what would be the professional consequences that you would have feared or another person in that situation would have feared? I think the most obvious thing would be you would be fired. They you would were, fire you just out of hand? I would think so. Yeah. I would think so. Um, yeah. Will they go after why, your medical license? I mean, how, how, how far are these folks willing yeah, to go? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think that would be a possibility, but you never know. Um, and it's these, these really severe professional consequences, but I think that when doctors are thinking about this risk-benefit analysis, when you know, maybe they're thinking about expressing this opinion, oftentimes they only think about the consequences to their career or like their income, right? Like they think, well, I have to stay silent because I have to 
preserve my income. I have yeah. kids in college. I have a mortgage or whatever. You spend 500 grand right. to get through medical school. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you spend all yeah. these years going to college. But I, I really think that it's an improper risk-benefit analysis because it may seem like it's far down the road or theoretical, but it's not because these things are happening now. If people don't speak out now, there's going to be no profession for our kids to go into. Like, if I have children, if, if, like, for your kids, how excited would you be if they were doctors, right? If they became a surgeon, because it's such an amazing profession. But just imagine if they had to go to medical school or a residency or become a surgeon. In order to do that, they had to bend the knee to this, to this perverse, to this evil ideology that if you were operating on someone in one room who has this real disease, in another room you have these kids who are undergoing these procedures that are not only completely meaningless, but putting them onto a road that is going to turn them into a chronic medical patient. Like, we have to understand that if there's any time for the average doctor to speak out, it's now. Because there's going to be no profession to pass on to your children if we don't try to preserve it at this point in time. And so I think it's changing. Uh, I've seen through some of the groups that have organized m more and more doctor, kind of uh, more and more people within the medical profession starting to question, starting to provide rebuttals, starting to uh, undermine a bit of the, the, the kind of pseudo consensus that has uh, arisen around trans medicine. And yet the institutions are more captured than ever. Mm -hmm. I mean, the institutions are fanatically obsessed with this. For them, it is a, a red line. They're willing to sacrifice their credibility, willing to sacrifice their professional integrity. And it seems like with so many other institutions, we have this slow-moving collapse because of the ideology. I did another, uh, another kind of small story of, a, I think it was University of Minnesota Medical School. They were doing the white lab, white coat oh, yeah. ceremony. Yeah, yeah. And they were repeating as in a mantra, mm -hmm. we're mm -hmm. going to decolonize medicine. We're going to make sure that race is factored into every decision. We're going to uh, uh, you know, dismantle white heteropatriarchal hetero ways of knowing. We're going to have indigenous solutions. And it's like, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't want indigenous medical solutions. I don't want to have a witchcraft ceremony or a voodoo medicine or mm -hmm. a witch mm -hmm. doctor. I've seen those things in, yeah. in my travels and my work as a documentary filmmaker. They're beautiful cultural um, uh, uh, performances. But they're not going to cure your cancer. Mm -hmm. Or they're not going to you know, pr provide a, 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 a kind of sterile medical environment to, to heal a, a, a surface wound, whatever it might be. But you have very smart people that are bought into this. Mm -hmm. And um, that's got to be dispiriting to see your colleagues, even, even the smartest ones, fall for this kind of uh, ideology. And it is, because the people I worked with are some of the best surgeons in the world. And Texas Children's is an amazing hospital. You have people who are doing the best surgeries, the biggest surgeries on the sickest kids. The average person who works there has such a big heart. It's, it's hard to even imagine what these people have to, to deal with on a daily basis. And it's, yeah, it's these small portions, these small minorities within these organizations that have been captured by this ideology, but it's starting to spread. And, and the results of it are preventing everyone else from speaking out, and I think the challenge is that when you have people who have committed to this idea, right, that you can change a boy to a girl just through the force of their words and the power of their will, that you could change all their chromosomes from one to the other, and everyone has to accept it, but you also have to give them medications and surgery, and you have to put them down this path. You commit so heavily to it that once you question it, you have to come to the conclusion, because that's the only conclusion you could come to, that you had contributed to a system that had destroyed the lives of these innocent children. So any questioning of it is opening up that opportunity. It's like whenever you shine a light onto it, it starts revealing this picture that's so horrific that these people will never look at it. They'll do anything to prevent themselves from ever seeing the truth. And that's why you have these people who are so antagonistic towards any type of debate, towards yeah. any questioning, because 
they had to go down with the ship because to acknowledge the consequences of their actions is such a severe, such a severe endeavor that I don't think they'll be able to do it. So we have your observation accelerating around 2022. You have the controversy. You leak, uh, uh, rather, you whistleblow to me information uh, that to show what was happening. Legislation gets passed within, I think, 36 hours, mm -hmm. abolishing uh, these procedures for minors. They have to wind down treatments and then either go out of state, uh, but can no longer happen in the state of Texas. That's a big win. I know we talked afterwards, you know, celebrated because we're both had desired to see that outcome and uh, I think contributed to it. You know, you can kind of, uh, you know, put your hat back on and, and walk into the distance, but then something happens. Then uh, the stakes raise for you. Tell me what happens next. Yeah, so the story came out May 16th, 2023. And I was graduating from my surgical residency about a month and a half later. Uh, the ceremony was supposed to be June 23rd. So, yeah, not too long after. And, you know, for those who are unfamiliar with your, the graduation from surgical training, this is like one of the most important days of your life, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's big. You spent yeah. so many years preparing for it. Now you can be a real doctor. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you know, you are a real doctor during residency. I know what you mean. Surgery, yeah. But, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, you're about to go on your own. And the training wheels are off. Exactly, yeah. 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 And you, you sacrifice so much during your training. You miss so many birthdays, so many weddings you lose count of these critical life moments that you'll never be able to get back. But the sacrifice is worth it because you now have this responsibility of, as a surgeon. You could do so much good for so many people. And that's such a, a meaningful thing to me. So the day you graduate is this monumental moment. So the day I was graduating was June 23rd. It was a Friday morning. And I was in my apartment. Um, my family was in town. I was getting ready for the ceremony later that night. This is the night before? No, this is yeah. the, the day of the graduation. The day of. Yeah. The day of. Yeah, so it's around like 11 a.m., I think. And uh, all of a sudden, you know, I get an aggressive, unexpected knock on the door. You know, I shuffle over. I'm wearing some stupid T-shirt and some, like, shorts I had from college. I know who it was. And I, I open it, and standing outside are two federal agents. They say they're with Health and Human Services and that they're investigating a, investigating a case regarding medical records, and they show me their badges. And it's one of those moments where, where time just stops. Yeah. And, and, you know, looking back on it, it's like you read about political tyranny in other countries. I read about it my whole life growing up. But I knew at that moment it showed up to my doorstep. And... They knew I was graduating later that day. They knew my family was in town. They knew how important that day was to me. But that was the point. This was their yeah. form of intimidation. They wanted me to cower in fear. They, they wanted to catch me you know, completely surprised. They wanted me to be, be in, in, in a state of fear. But as they're soon coming to find out, they have severely miscalculated because you know, at that moment, right, you're, on, you're not thinking about that. You just yeah. kind of freak out, right? You just, you don't right. know what to do. Yeah. So I invite these people in, and uh, uh, we sit down, and uh, we start talking. And then luckily, my wife um, comes out. She's an attorney. And uh, she had pulled me aside. And she's like, yeah, well, you know, probably not the best idea. We should probably you might want to not say anything. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> and we politely tell them, and then, and then they leave. And then, but they hand me a target letter saying I was a potential target of an investigation. So it was, a, it was it, again, it was one of those moments that you just can't believe you would ever be in a position, especially in this country. And that day we decided to fight, that we would never beg for forgiveness or leniency for something, for, for when what I had done was the right thing to do, when it was my professional responsibility, when the misconduct we had exposed was voted to become illegal within 24 hours, when the hospital was lying to the public and what these people are doing to these kids is putting them on a road that's going to turn them into chronic medical patients. That I will never, ever bow down or bend the knee to people who want to make that, make exposing the truth of that into a crime. So ever, ever since then, you know, our life had, had changed 
in a way that we would have never imagined. And so we had... Well, you go to your graduation, right? Yeah, I mean, well, <laughs> oddly enough, so... Yeah. You're like, am I going to get a, you know, <laughs> no. are there going to be agents lined up at the, at the well, ceremony? Yeah. No, that's, that's kind of what we yeah. thought. Um, so <laughs> once we decided to fight, and, and we were like, we're not going to, we're not going to let these people intimidate us. That's right. We're not going to beg for forgiveness. So we're like, all right, well, what do we do? We just got to go to the graduation. So we went out, we bought a couple bottles of champagne. We hung out on our patio. We drank all the champagne, and we, we listened to, like, this, Vietnam War music that would really pump you up, like, you know, Creed in the Clearwater and Jimi Hendrix. And, and uh, then we went to the graduation, and we had a great time, and um, it, was, it was fun. And, and my wife completely broke down during the ceremony when uh, one of my attendings was speaking about me. People thought it's because uh, uh, <laughs> she, was, she was moved by the speech, but it was really because these federal agents had come to our yeah. apartment a little bit earlier. Um, so that was, that was quite an experience. And then, but from there... You know, I, I really got to say that you had uh, stepped up to the plate, you know, because uh, when we called you and we told you, you know, you had put us in touch with Marcella Burke, who's, who's quite a personality, um, who, who's representing us now. So what was that like? She's an attorney. She's a kind of a yeah. f former uh, government attorney. Yeah. Well, so, yeah. so Marcella Burke, I mean, I can't believe that someone like her was introduced to us at this time where it was so important. Because she, she was in big law, she was a partner, had this huge salary, this amazing opportunity, but she left it because she didn't want to put pronouns in her bio. And she led this exodus of other big law attorneys to start her own firm in order to take cases like this. And it just so happened that she had started her firm a couple months before. And because she's such a fighter, because she has such a strong foundation in the principles she believes in, that she was able to somehow be in the circle that you were in. That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I, I've always wondered, what was yeah. it like for you when well, uh, I call you that day? Because, it, it, I mean, it must have been pretty wild. Well, you know, we talked before the story went out. I said, hey, this is a big deal. This is going to be controversial. People are going to be very, you know, want to come after, uh, you know, the, the, the person. They're going to do an internal investigation at the hospital, we can presume. And, you know, laying out the risks of, of, of you know, I'll obviously protect your anonymity um, uh, until you want to come forward. But I think you knew the risks and you were very conscious of it. You had spoken with your wife, who's an attorney who also knows the risks. And so I think, you know, what I saw is that you were, ready, obviously hoping that it didn't come to it, but ready. And then when you called that day, I remember thinking, all right, okay, here it is. Like, you know, where, where are we? What resources can we mobilize? I called some folks in very high levels of Texas politics, uh, called, you know, my, my lawyers to kind of get a sense of, hey, who's, who's around? And uh, from a couple different points, a few people said, hey, you got to get connected with, with Burke um, because Marcella, she knows not only the law, um, she's not only very aggressive, um, but she also knows the politics behind these issues. She can get your, 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 her clients protected from multiple avenues. And so, you know, I remember talking to her and then putting all, everyone in touch, uh, you know, as, as kind of carefully as possible. And, uh, and then thinking, all right, well, you know, this is, this is the right person and then we'll see how it goes. And then I think after that, it kind of disappeared for a while, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm things kind of vanished. And that's been my experience with some of these, uh, you know, some of these kind of cases where they'll, 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 they'll ramp up, they'll start to threaten, and then they'll, they'll, they'll disappear. And so I remember there was a lull, and then things kind of escalated from there. Then you get a letter from the, the kind of state attorney, or you get a call, or, you know, re remind me what happens after that. So I wouldn't want to really go too much into details of the specifics of the conversations or anything, but... In let, general, what happens. Yeah, yeah. The, the letter we get was just from the one these agents had get, given me, but, you know, we weren't quite sure what was going to happen. And over the next few months, it became clear to us, we had reason to believe that this investigation was not being pursued in order to, to pursue blind justice, right? It was being pursued for ideological and political reasons, which is obvious. Yeah. Because what these people have suggested is that heavy criminal charges 
are going to be brought for something that even on the most, the, 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 the loosest sense of the term would be a minor technicality, and even that would be a very a charitable, yeah. a very charitable circumstance, especially because what we had exposed was both become illegal, and, and they were lying to the public, right? But also all the information, there was no person identifying information. I mean, anytime a doctor does a report or does an academic paper, you're citing anonymized exactly. data. This mm -hmm. is standard practice. You know, even Freud would just change the names in, in, his, in his work and, and, and you know, oh, you know, patient A was doing, it's like, this is so uncontroversial. The lawyers mm -hmm. that I talked to said, it's, it's not even close. Only because it's about trans are we mm -hmm. seeing any action at all. And we're seeing like hysterical legal threats mm -hmm. because the Biden administration, the medical associations and the trans activists have taken power at that administrative level. And the only way their ideology survives is if they destroy anyone who questions mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the impression that I got as, 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 the, as you've continued to kind of dance with these folks. Yeah. Um, and that, in and general, that, without, you know, without uh, making your lawyer upset, you know, tell us then, summarize then what happens mm -hmm. after these uh, goons show up to your house and then, and then, and then after, after that. Yeah, yeah. It, the assumption must have been that the goal was to just put this person in a position where he's so scared that he's just going to roll over because that's what they want to do. The, they want to prevent other whistleblowers in other hospitals from speaking out because people are starting to wake up to what's happening. So you have more doctors who are going to be willing to do this. And we know these agencies have a vested interest in it because of the Health and Human Services uh, uh, Department's uh, public expression of support for the transgender ideology. Right. I mean, you just look at their public fees and, and it's just littered with support for this kind of thing. So of course, anyone, any doctor who speaks out and exposes misconduct happening at hospitals, they're going to go after in the most severe way possible. But there has to be a situation where doctors like me are able to speak out, are able to simply tell the truth and have a way to fight back. Because for us, there was no way for me to fight back. I had to we had to develop a strategy, a group of people who are willing to fight alongside of us because we knew we couldn't do it alone. Like we had resources, like savings for like two months and then we're completely done. There's no way we can do it after that. So we knew we needed people and that's one thing I, I realized and which I want to communicate with really to, to all those doctors out there who might be listening to this, who who might consider the same thing is that once you cross to the other side, like you think it's just your life is going to be destroyed and everything, but you come to the conclusion that there are so many people out there who are willing to stand alongside of you and sacrifice something meaningful for a cause worth fighting for. And they will support you in any way possible, whether it's through connections, through um, uh, you know, legal defense or anything else. But the other important thing was that we knew we need people to help us out, but we also knew we need a strategy. Because we can defend my case, right? Because it's obviously these people are pursuing me for political and ideological reasons. They want to prevent other whistleblowers from speaking out. But the defense is meaningless without offensive action against people who potentially have abused their authority. That has to be a critical component because there's no way to make this not happen in the future. In order to prevent it from happening, we have to make sure we hold those accountable, which is exactly what we're going to do. And tell, tell me to the extent that you are able about that strategy. I mean, first off, you are revealing your name, you're revealing your identity, you're going public. From a pure legal standpoint, that's probably uh, 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 creates a, its own challenge. Um, tell me why you've decided uh, to come forward, why you've decided to raise this issue publicly, and how that fits into the broader strategy. So 
my decision to come forward is because once we know that this investigation is being pursued for ideological and political reasons, it becomes unpredictable. And, and it's now at the U.S. Attorney's Office, so yeah, things yeah. are getting more yeah. serious. It's not just yeah. a you know, bureaucrat. So yeah. I refuse to sit by and let the narrative be created by other people. Because we know we're going to be buried by an avalanche of propaganda, and people need to hear the truth. People need to hear what happened. Because if people do, they're going to see what's happening in the systems that are meant to pursue justice in this country. And there's so many other examples where you see authority in this country being weaponized to target innocent Americans who simply speak the truth. And there has to be a point where average people are unwilling to just kneel and take it. And for me, I refuse. There will be no situation where I will let these people dictate the, the parameters of this story without me telling the truth, because we know we're not going to get it from them. And as you're, you've, come, you're, you've made the decision to come forward, I mean, what I've, what I've seen, what I've, I've observed as, a, as an outsider is that you have a very partisan, very ideological, uh, left-wing assistant U.S. attorney who is pursuing this case beyond the, the, the bounds of the law. I mean, from, from, mm -hmm. from you, 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 know, you were very careful in how you decided to be a whistleblower to protect yourself, to protect the hospital, to protect all patients. Um, and yet this is not going away. I've seen a dance between the U.S. Attorney's Office and between your attorneys. And it seems like, from my point of view, you're saying, enough. Come at me or don't come at me but we're gonna force a decision. I think it's a bold move to come public because you're basically throwing down and saying, I'm ready, I'm confident, I'm gonna, I'm gonna publicly uh, come out to persuade people to what's happening is truly wrong and you're staking your reputation on it. What do you foresee happening now that you're going public? I think I can't really predict what might happen because you know it's, beyond our hands. I think the answer to that question has probably already been made, and at some point we're going to find out whether we want to or not. But I wouldn't really want to comment too much on the communications between us and the office. But I think, yeah, it is, it is a bold move. I think that you know, it's, it's one of those things where you, people probably listening to this probably think, man, that's insane. That's probably crazy. Why would he do that? But I think it's kind of clear when you think about the reality of it, right? We're just telling the truth. That's it. Why should someone be prosecuted for telling the truth if the justice system increasingly protects criminals from the innocent and just goes after people who say true things and who expose what's happening? Then what kind of world are we delivering our children into? So it may seem like, like a bold thing to do for most people, but when you think about what's at stake, this is not bold at all. It's what we have to do. It's what I have to do. And so it's a test, if, in some sense, for um, the question, are our institutions functioning? Are they committed to truth and justice and equal treatment? Or has this ideology deranged them to such an extent that they can no longer function for their purpose? And it sounds like you're actually an optimist, though. Um, you would not be putting your neck out there. You would not be taking this risk if you didn't believe, at least in a certain regard, that the truth will win, that justice will prevail. I think I'm an optimist in the sense that I believe in the power of the truth, that the best way to live your life is just to say true things and to live in a true way. I don't believe that by us telling a story or by exposing what's true, it would change people who have already been corrupted. I think what we have to do is wake those people up who have been asleep to allow them to see what their country has turned into. That you have people who simply told the truth who are being investigated by the most powerful federal government 
in the history of the world in the of the world. And that at some point, it's our responsibility to fight against it, because. If we don't do it now, it's, it's going to be too late. So I believe in the power of the truth to mobilize good people to action. Because it was other people who demonstrated courage in the past, whether it be recently or in previous generations, that gave me the, the strength to know that this was the right thing to do. And that no matter what the consequences are, really no matter what any of the consequences are, that will we'll never bend the knee to, to their ideology or their narrative, never. And what do you fear is at stake? Is your, your, you know, your finances, your license, your liberty? I mean, do you worry about getting you know, thrown in jail? What, 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 what in, in your <laughs> darkest moments, when, you're, when, the, when the fear creeps in, what do you fear? Um, <clears throat> well... I think that, you know, the finances, well, that's already past gone. I mean, you know, <laughs> we already know that's, we don't have anything left, you know. All, you know, a bunch of money we had saved is, is, is gone. Evaporated, yeah. Uh, so that's one thing. And then the job, possible, very likely. That's a risk. That's a risk I'm willing to take. But again, like I mentioned before, if I don't do it now, what profession is going to, they're going to be for, for my children. But any risk of, of legal risks, it's worth it. What we did to get this clinic shut down protected countless children. And that's the truth. And if that's something I have to sacrifice for, then so be it. But I believe that, at least in this country, there's enough good people to know that the, the right thing will prevail. So, Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree, and I certainly hope that that is true. And how can people who hear your story um, and want to support what you're doing and recognize the, the, the risk that you're putting yourself in, how can they help? How can they support this, uh, this effort? And really this David versus Goliath yeah. effort. I mean, you're going up against the federal government on an issue where they are uh, uh, totally committed. What can people do to help? People can donate to the fundraiser that we've set up, and it's going to go a long way to really push this whole thing forward, make sure that people are held accountable and that these whistleblowers can speak out and be able to do the right thing without you know, consequences that will destroy their whole lives. So. Great. Well, and uh, I know I'll be supporting the fundraiser the minute it launches. That'll be happening right now. I'd encourage everyone else uh, to chip in what you can uh, because, look, this is... Uh, this is a test case. It's a test case not just for, for your own safety, which, uh, which is important, not only for your own reputation, which I hope uh, you're able to vigorously defend against these attacks, but also is going to set a new standard because if, if you win, we can all win, and those kids that are now not getting you know, cut up at Texas Children's Hospital, that's done. Um, we can expand that effort to other places and really put a price on this mm -hmm. so that we're not going to be intimidated anymore. Yeah. And so um, uh, in my experience, with a lot of these threats, with a lot of these actions, with a lot of this positioning, is that if you come out strong as you're doing, if you come out publicly, if you stand behind what you're doing and you make available all the evidence, um, it's still, even in this environment where it's, highly partisan, highly ideological, I think it will still prevail. Mm -hmm. And so um, for me, this is an essential test case. I hope that everyone uh, can help chip in. Yeah, and, and I think that really in terms of support, it kind of like what you said, the most important thing is for people to give up that fear. Yeah. That if there's any way to support it, it would be that. Good. All right. Well, we will um, we'll follow up. Um, if anyone wants to leave comments, great. If anyone wants to leave support, if anyone has any other ideas, um, get in touch, and is there anyone else, any, way, any other way that people can reach you? No, really, you know, helping us out with the fundraiser is going to be the most important thing. Okay, good deal. All right, well, good luck. All right, thank you.